In Cheech is not my real name, Cheech Marin writes candidly about growing up as a wisecracking kid in South Central LA, resisting the draft and his chance meeting with Tommy Chong and how they formed one of the most successful comedy acts of all time, breaking up, reuniting, and still performing together to this day. Please welcome to the stage, Cheech Marin. How you doing? Thank you, thank you. Have a seat. No, no, please, please sit. Are you, uh, how's everybody today? So let's start with some easy stuff here. Okay. I actually like the, the, the book cover itself. Yeah. Um, it kind of symbolizes a little something to me, but I want to get your take yes. on, yeah, I want to get your take on what it actually means. Well, I was means. trying to support the piñata industry, you know. <laughs> that was what I was going to say. It was good. No, it's kind of breaking up the old image and uh, seeing what's inside. Right. I think. Uh, so your real name actually is not Cheech. No. Which is? It's Richard. Uh, Dick for short, although not really, um, <laughs> but that's what they call me chief. Why did you want to write this book in the first place? I mean, you're well known over many years yeah. for many different things, but why venture into the author territory? Oh, uh, money, you know. Uh, they offered me a lot of money to do it, so uh, okay. Um, you know, <laughs> really, that's the truth. Uh, I, w I was doing an art talk uh, in, in San Diego, and there was a, a literary agent in the audience. She says, these stories are great. You've got to make a book out of them. So I, I, so I said, can you give me a deal? Yeah, OK. She did. And uh, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it was that easy? Anyone can write a book? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, you know, anybody can write a book, whether it's good or not. Who knows? Um, no, it was that. It, and then it took a little while to, you know, put all the stories together and see what, and get a rhythm and. Right. Uh, but I've been a writer since I was little. You know, I've always wrote, written, wrote. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> so you've written. I wrote. Uh, you wrote a lot of stuff. Uh, well, I guess. Is it writing if it's improv? I guess it's recording. Well, yeah. I mean, if you do it again, it's writing. The same thing. <laughs> How many times did you write this book? Oh, this book? Not that many times. You know, I was really kind of, I, I, I think a lot before I, uh, unlike some authors, um, I think a lot before I put it down. And so I, well, I was pretty satisfied. And I had a, uh, a collaborator who would, uh, like, you know, my, like a trainer, mm -hmm. uh, John Hassan. He was, okay, we need to go over this again, blah, 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 blah. But it was good. So know? how long did it take then? <sighs> the actual writing part, maybe about, I don't know, six months. Oh, that's not bad. No, it's pretty good. Yeah. I, I write fast, you know. I'm on right. demand. <laughs> so, the um, but putting the stories together, did you have an outline, or how did how did you piece it together in your well, your well, muse I, there? I knew that I wanted to kind of tell the whole life story, but I didn't want to start it then on this day I was born. So I started it in Medias Res, uh, where I was in. Uh, in uh, Canada, and how did I get here? Mm -hmm. How does a South Central LA born uh, kid uh, uh, get to Calgary, Alberta, you know, without coercion? Um, and so I, I, uh, I started there, and it was kind of this existential uh, quandrum I was, I was in, because it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, and I was uh, going to Canada ostensibly to be a potter. Right. Yeah. A potter, and I did. I, I made pottery professionally for a couple of years. Well, you actually start in the book before that. You, you go into a little bit of the South Central history. Yeah. Uh, but when you were a kid, in 1952, you said you were on a radio show called The House Party, hosted mm. by Arn Linkletter, yeah. right, right? So what happened on that? Well, you know, it was, it was a radio program first, and very shortly thereafter, he, he put it on TV uh, called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Mm -hmm. And he would try to get kids to spill the beans on the family, you know, like, <laughs> my mother's pregnant, my daddy doesn't know. And, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so, uh, uh, so I was uh, chosen, well, I was in first grade, I believe, I was chosen along with a couple other classmates to uh, uh, get in a limo with every candy and soda and cookie that uh, available on earth and eat them all before we got to the studio. And then we, so, then we put on the show. And you just show up all hopped up. And well, zzz, <laughs> they open the door and like four sugar-laden buzzing bees <laughs> jumped out. You know? uh, yeah, I brought that up because in the book you mentioned that that's where you got the acting bug. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. It was like the first time I'd ever been on something. No, actually, I was, I was in a school play, no, a Christmas play. And I, and I, was, I played the kettle drum. And... and <laughs> And we did up on the house, up on the roofs, house, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. That was the kettle drum part. And, and I was always a little kid. I mean, little. I was always the littlest guy in the, in the class. And, and, uh, and, you, and I, they, 
for some reason they incited me to do the kettle drum, and I and you couldn't see me. Uh, every kid in the, in, in the in this little rendition had a, a, a band, a paper band with a gold star on it, like that. You know? And that's all you could see of me. It's this little gold star kind of, <laughs> and the hand would come out, out boom, 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 and everybody thought that was hilarious. So, so hey, they're laughing. They're show business. All right, <laughs> it's a highlight for me. <laughs> so your your. Family was in South Central L. A. How did your parents end up there? Like before you were born? Oh, uh, that's where they grew up. Oh, really? Yeah, that's so where the, they grew up. They were, yeah. they were they were born in L. A. My grandparents were all from Mexico, uh, but my parents, myself, all my children, all my grandchildren were born in L. A. Hmm. I want to read a, a quote here from the book because you're talking about moving to Granada Hills. Um, Our neighborhood was all tract houses and bordered by orange groves. At night, the aroma of orange blossoms was intoxicating. The first night in the house, I was awakened by a noise. I was afraid. It sounded like the house was being electrocuted. I went over to the window. The sound grew louder. I opened the window, and it still got louder. Then I realized what it was. The sound of a million crickets had replaced the screaming sirens and gunshots. I'll make that trade every time. Boy, really, it was... Uh, I was I was a kid in, in South Central. It was a very violent neighborhood, and there was a lot of shootings, a lot of killings. I saw, I saw two homicides right in front of my eyes before my I was seven years old, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was always... A, kids that grew up in that neighborhood, it was predominantly black, about 90%. Uh, some Mexicans, a couple Asians, and one lost white guy, you know, wandering around. <laughs> <laughs> and, with the big camera. <laughs> yeah. And it was, it, was, it was a tough tough neighborhood, and uh, uh, so there was always that that tension in there. Mm -hmm. So people in those neighborhoods always grew up with uh, early onset uh, heart attack, stroke, hypertension, and so because it's, 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 you know, it's tense in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I was still to this day, the sound of sirens freaked me out, and I looked for some place to hide because, you know. Is that why we had to drag you out of the green That's exactly here? why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's New York, man, sirens. Oh, man. Yeah. And, and so uh, then and so we moved from there, from South Central to Granada Hills, which was a suburb of the San Fernando Valley, which was primarily orange groves. It was an agricultural, uh, agricultural neighborhood that they were converting to housing tracks. And um, and so one day everybody was black, and then the next day everybody was white, and it was like, how does this work? Where is where is the black people? There's no <laughs> black people. How come there's no black people here? You know, and so it was it was interesting to make that change. So in in the book though, you talk about you make little comments like like what you just said. There's a lot of uh, uh, mentions about race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did that affect, I guess, who you are now and, and what you brought into your acts later on, the racial or oh. lack of racial diversity, I guess? Uh, a black, the black culture and, and neighborhoods and, and uh, aesthetic uh, informed a great part of what we did, mm -hmm. uh, Tommy Chong and I, because he came from a black background, too, because... Uh, he was born in Calgary, Alberta, uh, and, and and he found the one black neighborhood in, in Calgary, you know. <laughs> it was called Amber Valley, and his wife uh, came from there, and, and, uh, and but he was a musician mm -hmm. and playing R&B from a very early age. He wrote so for Diana Ross. He wrote for Diana Ross yeah. and, and the, the Supremes. And, uh, <coughs> and so he... Um, his his musical education was primarily R and B and jazz, and, and my musical education was prim primarily from South Central R and B, same thing, and jazz. So that's we understood each other really well in in, in those terms of musical terms. I mean, we always viewed Cheech and Chong in terms of music, or, or, or comedy in ter terms of music, because. It was a rhythmic thing for us, and it had a rhythm, and it had a beat, and we knew uh, when to come in and when to stay out. And, 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 and so when we first came to L.A. from Canada, uh, all we played was black clubs in L.A. There was a right. big, there was a big uh, um, network of, of uh, black clubs, and they had the old format. They had a, a professional MC who introduced a professional comedian, and then the comedians would introduce the floor show. And we played in all the clubs in L.A., and finally we made it to the top, uh, um, playing this club called PJ's in uh, Hollywood. It was the Uptown Black Club in Hollywood. And we opened for everybody. We were the house comedians. We opened for everybody. Uh, Ray Charles, uh, Carmen McRae, the Isley Brothers, uh, 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 
the impressions. Uh, the, uh, and one night, even Marvin Gaye got up and sang What's Going On right when it was first out. So we were like right in the heart of that. And that always informed, and it, and it spilled over into our comedy. We had a black rhythm and a big black audience that, that maintains itself to this day in, in our following. Really? Huh. Yeah. Um, I want to, uh, we have a, lots to talk about with actually Cheech and Chong, okay. but getting back to, I want to go back real quick to when you were younger, that you, you actually were in Catholic school yeah. in high school, right? Yes. And in, you were an altar boy. Yes. So obviously, you know, the weed smoking and the pot and the Catholic <laughs> stuff, you know, go hand in hand, right? That's, that's exactly. <laughs> right. Um, well, it, you know, funny thing is it did, is that's the first time I it really, really understood what the mass was about. I went to Easter <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> I'm not kidding, man. I went to Easter Sunday, high mass, candles, incense, blah, blah, blah. And I, I smoked a little sm a weed before I went to, oh, I get it. It's a multimedia experience, you know? <laughs> there was this ceremony, ritualistic ceremony yeah. going on, transubstantiation, and, and you know, and the priests, and they were and everybody was dressed in, in, their, in their garments. And they're like, oh, I get it. You're supposed to be assaulted in order to create this a religious experience. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> why do you think they in. have it? <laughs> in, in in high school too, you said that you were were every teacher's worst nightmare uh, because you got straight A's, yeah, straight but A's. were the class clown. I was a pain in the ass. I, and that I, I was a wise ass that never shut up, and that was always my trouble. I was always getting in trouble. Not that I was wasn't a malicious kid or got in trouble or right, mm -hmm. but I I got, couldn't shut up. You know, uh, so I thought, well, maybe there's show business in my future. Um, but it, it was, uh, yeah, I was, I was always, but I, would, but I was straight A student, mm. so they, they, uh, I, and I would fuck with them as much as I possibly could, you know. Right. What would you do? I would just, uh, I, I, the thing they don't want you to do in Catholic school is answer them back. That's the thing they don't want, because they teach you, and this is the philosophy, they, uh, uh, Catholic education teaches you how to think. Just don't think that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's really, it's like, wait a minute, how, how do you figure out if God can do this? Well, then what do you? And and they just they didn't like that at all. You know, you're supposed to fall in line and, and but but it was a good liberal arts education, which I, I highly mm -hmm. value. And most of your family, or some of your family, went into the priesthood or went into religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have yeah. two uh, cousins that became priests and a, and, a, and a, another cousin that became a nun. Yeah, and I was and, scheduled to right. go to the seminary, and I discovered girls. <laughs> and and wait, let me get this straight: no girls in the priest. I, I don't think so. And then you went to college. I did. Went to college, uh, and where we're talking about pot. You know, a quote from the book: "What else have they been lying about?" Yeah, <laughs> uh, that was my first reaction when I smoked my first joint. You know, and I, I don't know. I was a, I was a straight kid, and uh, and. They, I was at a party and somebody handed me a joint. Ooh, well, I'm in college, well, and I took a hit and I got high and I go and I looked around. Wow, what else have they been lying about? Because <laughs> this is not at all what they've been warning me about. And then, this was also uh, the the hippie revolution happening at the same time. You also got into transcendental meditation. Yeah, very very early. I was a pre Beatles, uh, and and and. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was that was the demarcation there, <laughs> pre Beatles, post Beatles, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I was w once again a girl led me into that, you know. So my girlfriend, I'm going to go meditate. Want to come? Uh, sure. Why not? <laughs> and uh, and I learned how to meditate uh, transcendentally, and I still do that to this day. Did you realize in college that you were actually that you already were a hippie, or did college you looked around and you're like, oh, I want to be like those guys? You know, it was a gradual transformation because it was happening to all of us at the same time. And, and, and I was the oldest of the baby boomers. The baby boomers started the year that I was born. And, and we started changing because we started, it, it was the worst thing that they could do, educate all these guys. And they asked questions and they didn't like the answers. And so, wait a minute, what's, what about this? Why is Vietnam? Where's Vietnam? What does it represent? They didn't attack us. They didn't topple the Twin Towers. They didn't bomb our uh, Pearl Harbor. They didn't invade us. Uh, uh, and this, I don't even know where it is. Why are we there? And, uh, and they, they expected everybody to fall in lockstep conformity mm -hmm. to that. And there was a, a college-educated generation with a lot of people backing them up that started questioning and they didn't like the answers. 
And and you were part of a movement to actually resist the draft. Yeah, it was actually called the draft resistance movement. It was headed by David Harris, who uh, who promulgated this, and and he was married to Joan Baez. And during the course, and so they became this famous hippie anti-war couple, and, and they traveled to campuses, and that's where I, I heard David Harris speak for the first time, and, and he just made the most sense. The, the, the philosophy behind the draft resistance movement was to not cooperate. It was, it was if, if, you're not a, if you're 18, don't register for the draft. If you've registered for the draft, draft, don't go to the physical. If you get drafted, don't show up for the, don't be drafted, and and it goes on. So to clog the, the bureaucracy, and that's what it did, you know. Because traditionally in history, if you look back at, it, especially here in, in New York, uh, anytime they institute a draft, it's a real division among among society because sometimes you can pay to get out of the draft, sometimes you can do crazy things to get out of the draft, but it's like. Because they can arbitrarily grab you, put you in the arm, and you can get killed, and it tends to change people's thinking at that point. You know, it's not some vague philosophical concept. You know, they can grab you, send you thousands of miles away into the jungle. For why am I here? Boink! You know, and it made everybody think. Yeah. And what did you do to your draft card, though? Oh, that's what's... well. <laughs> I first I got it signed by Muhammad Ali. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was we went to this big anti-war demonstration in Century City in Los Angeles. It was, it was the big one. Johnson, President Johnson, was the guy, and they were they were, he was speaking in Century City, and there was this big anti-war draft uh, rally in, in Rancho Park right next to it, and so. Uh, 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 Muhammad Ali shows up, and it was just, he had just won the, the World Heavyweight Championship beating Sonny Liston, the unbeatable, and he was this young guy, and at the same time, he came out as, as, as a black Muslim, and he was already, but he hadn't announced it until he, he won the championship, and he shows up, and he was the most physically impressive human being I'd ever seen, he was, and he's big, he's like 6'4", somewhere around there, and he was young, and he was like Chisel, he was really good looking. He had even a black suit with a bow tie. This guy was a star, you could tell. Right. And, and, and he was extremely charismatic and, and extremely accessible. And he started giving his uh, his speech. And, and then after, we, everybody crowded around. And he was signing autographs. So I handed him my draft card. <laughs> M. Ali, re real legible, too. Yeah. And so then I took that draft card and I turned it in. And it went on a collage that <laughs> that uh, accompanied David Harris and Joan Baez on mm -hmm. the speaking tour around the country. And you could actually see it. It was on the cover of Newsweek magazine. And if you looked at the collage, and right in the corner, you could see my draft card with M. Ali on it. You know? Wow. And so it, it actually, uh, you ripped up your draft card, though. Well, because that, that, that prompted the, the escape? No. The, the, no, I, 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 oh, I dropped ripped up my registration card, oh. not my actual draft card, because there was an actual turn-in day. You, you turned in your draft card. And, um, and the, the, uh, the, the director of the draft at that time, General Hershey, uh, issued this directive that anybody who protested, uh, uh, caused commotion at the draft center, uh, burned their draft card, or did, I did on all those things, and that would immediately be reclassified from their 2S uh, uh, student deferment to 1A would be drafted and sent to the front lines in Vietnam. That was his fix. Wow. So. And, and you know, I, I, everybody thought it was bullshit and it would be overturned. It was basic First Amendment. And it was eventually overturned, went to the uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, but you're going to spend three years, maybe four in the can. At 11, they were send, sentencing the draft resistors to eight years in Leavenworth at that time. And, Coincidentally, in my last uh, semester in school, uh, I, I discovered pottery. Mm -hmm. I took a pottery class. You know, I had the, in the last semester in school, you always. You Which thought, is also for a girl. Yeah, it was always for a girl. Yeah, yeah. It's always for yeah. a girl. <laughs> it was a, you know, I, I took all the classes that I had been putting off for four years, you know, Econ 101 and all that. And I had one spot, spot left over, and then there was this really cute girl that I had. Class with previously, and I said, "Well, what do you take?" She says, I'm, "I'm taking pottery. You should take it with me. I should take it with you." you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's like, and so I, I I started making pottery, and and as soon as my hands touched that clay, and I centered my first wad of clay, 
it's like a tuning fork went off, you know, and and uh, uh, and my Mexican jeans came busting out. <laughs> hey Holmes, where you been? We've been waiting for you. Come on, let's make a pass. And and it ch and it changed my life. I mean, I, I really, it really it changed my life. And I I, just, I quit my job. I quit my classes. I got a nine hundred dollar NEDA loan, and I and I made pottery it, it, from sun up to sundown. And and uh, so at the same time, the draft was kind of uh, um, hovering over me. And uh, my my pottery teacher, who kind of knew of my of my predicament, he said, "I have this uh, the other ex student that has a pottery up in Canada, mm -hmm. and he's very famous, and he just won the bicentennial exhibition award. He's a big deal. I'm going to write him and see if you can be his assistant." I, I didn't even wait for an answer. I got on the Greyhound, and boom, I was I was the next thing I was in Calgary, mm -hmm. and uh, working for this man named Ed Drahanchuk. That was great. And you were out in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah. So it's your first. What, I forget what you said in the book, the statistic. It was the first winter they've had in like 80 years that where a whole week was below 60 degrees, or uh, negative 60 just degrees. Just or about. It was the coldest winter in 80 years in Calgary. And the, the high in January was 20 below. It, w it was always 40 below. They got into 50 and then one night 75 below. And there was no running water in no, your cabin. Nothing, you know. Yeah. And it was you had to go to the river every day to, with my little wagon with my with my uh, 20 20 gallon jug and uh, and get go to the river and get water and then chop wood every day, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was from South Central. I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd never seen snow in my life, you know. Much less go to the river for my water and chop wood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and there was and there was. A lot of wildlife around. There's a lot of bears around, and I lived in this little log cabin. It had electricity, but that's it, and a potbelly stove and an outhouse. And so I'd always try to uh, 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 take a crap at work. You know, they had a flush toilet <laughs> because in the middle of the night you got to go out to this house house, 40 below, sit on a wooden toilet seat with bears around. You know, <laughs> and, and I had a shotgun. I had a shotgun. I would take it with me every time. You know, and it's 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 a you little hard to relax in that situation. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I just want to dump and get out of there. Like, <laughs> welcome to the wilderness. And then I I I know I, I keep talking about this. I'll move on. But I find it just fascinating. You told a story too about shooting. What was it? A, a a moose in the middle of that lake, and then having to chop it up with yeah. a or chop it up with a chainsaw to chainsaw. take it out of the lake. He was the guy who worked for Ed Drahanchuk. He was he was of Ukrainian descent. And he was a, a hunter, an avid yeah. hunter. He went hunting all the time, and and he was this great potter. And, and he taught. I'd never fired a gun in my life, mm -hmm. even though my father was a policeman for thirty years in, in LAPD. Mm -hmm. and, and so he said, "Come on, we're going to go hunting. I'm going to show you how to hunt." Okay, great. And we'd go hunting, and so one, it says, there's a moose in this area. I know there is, and so I heard, I heard that there was. So we went hunting this moose, and, and we worked all, all day trying to find him. Almost to dark, and we find this moose. It's standing in the middle of a muskeg. A muskeg is like a little shallow, frozen lake with a big crust of ice on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so he says, all right, you go to the other end of the, the, the lake and, 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 and try to scare him towards me. When he comes out, I'll shoot him. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Make faces? Or, <laughs> <laughs> and so I went out to the thing and I tried to, hey, come, come on, Moose, you know, because I didn't want him to charge me, yeah. you know. <laughs> and so after a while, he went in and he stood there in the, in the middle of this lake. That's not working. So Ed signaled me to come back and I came back and it's starting to get dark and there's bears out, you know. And I get a little nervous, you know, and so he says, well, he says, I'm going to have to drop him right here, and which he did, he shot this moose, moose goes, and so, okay, let's go get him, and, we go, and the moose weighs 1,500 pounds, you know, and so we both grabbed a leg, <laughs> we have to go back to the truck, yeah, let's get out of here, because this ain't working, no, no, we got to go with the saw. And he goes in the back, he has a little chainsaw. We had to go back and cut this moose into four quarters. Oh. Oh. And then hook it up, hook it up to like, like a plow, uh, like a, a, what do they call this? Yeah, like a, we were in yoke, you know? And we hooked it up and then dragged these quarters out and they're frozen you're, and you're going through this like crunch, 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 crunch. And, uh, and it's, now it's dark and it's, and it's, it's, but we got them out and so had moose meat for a long yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> so then fast forward a little bit to, to getting to Vancouver and you get to meet Tommy Chong. What yeah. happened there? How did you meet him and what was that like? Well, eventually I made it to Vancouver 
and uh, I was delivering carpets uh, and uh, and writing for this rock and roll magazine called Poppin. It was a music scene magazine in Vancouver, and the editor uh, said, "You know, I got this guy I know that you, you should meet him. He's he's running this real weird kind of thing in Chinatown. Well, what kind of thing? <laughs> Is it opium den with girls? Is that?" Um, <laughs> No, you know, he said, he says he's he's running an improvisational theater company in a topless bar, <laughs> in, in in like the worst part of town in Junkie, Winoville, Skid Row, downtown uh, Vancouver. I says, well, you know, some of it sounds intriguing, <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> so he so he, had, he had me meet uh, uh, Tommy out in this farmhouse. And, and Tommy Chong at that time had really long hair for the day. It was really long and, and a scraggly beard and, and leather pants and a jailhouse tattoo. And he's half Chinese and half English Irish. And, and he looked at me and I looked at him. We both had the same thought. What in the hell are you? You know, <laughs> what, are you Mongolian and a biker? Or, and he, because he had never seen the Mexican before. <laughs> and he's like, saying, what, are you a, a Filipino? Or, and so and so we got together, and he was running this. He had he was with Motown with with this Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's his his group that he wrote that he had song for, and and uh, uh, during that period of traveling around, he had seen improvisational theater, he'd seen Second City and the mm -hmm. Committee, and he got intrigued. And and even though he never said a word on stage, he just played guitar. He decided after he split with the band that that that's what he wanted to do. It's improv. Yeah, um, improv. And so, and he had a venue when he got back to the Vancouver. There was his parents had turned his last club into a Vancouver's first topless club, and so he saw. The, and so he had this idea, and he was working the lights when he first got back, just to have something to do. And he kept seeing these girls come in that, that were the dancers, and and they were so sexy in their in their bell bottom low cut jeans and their crop tops and their. And he said, and, but once they got into their stripper gear, they weren't. So sexy, and, and the guys wouldn't even look at him. You know, they were there to drink, and it was like a tough crowd: loggers, bikers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, prostitutes, pimps, and 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 all. Because it was a, you know, hooker central, and then they ran their office out of the club, and like you do, yeah, like it's, it's yeah. like it's, it's, <laughs> John's and liquor. Yeah, <laughs> it worked really well, and so he he had this bright idea that he would have the girls start off fully clothed and be involved in some kind of little skit, you know, like a jokes out of Playboy, you know, mm -hmm. a guy walks in. And, and, and he found that when, during the course of the skit, that the girls would start to strip, the audience was like intrigued, you know, because before, when the girls were stand, dancing naked on, on the stage, the guys wouldn't even look at them. They're like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And once the, 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 the voyeuristic element of it, like the girls out there, you could hear a pin drop in the place. <laughs> and so he said, I'm on to something. So he started writing these little skits, and, and he had a couple, there was four topless dancers, a mime artist, <laughs> I swear to God, <laughs> a full white face. And, you know, all that. Did the mime strip? Yeah, and, 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 and at the <laughs> strip bar. No, he didn't, but we, oh, okay. we, uh, we'd like to. A mime artist, a classical guitarist. And four topless girls and me and Tommy and a couple other guys and like, and for this audience that didn't want to see us, you know, they, they didn't want to see long-haired guys talking to them. They wanted to see naked girls, you know, right. and it was like, oh, it was it was fabulous. But then you guys ended up. You, you said you ended up inventing hippie burlesque. Yeah, that's basically what it was because it was it was strippers with comedian, and that's classical. Classic burlesque, you know, the, mm -hmm. that's where all the old style comedians, mm -hmm. you know, Phil Silvers and all those guys came out of. And so we started doing it, but for the hippie generation, and we started taking things that were happening on the street. I, I got hired as, as a writer primarily, and so I could, I can write for this stuff. <laughs> he, he, I know I know what I'm talking about here. And so, uh, uh, and so I started writing skits for them, and then filling in whenever anybody didn't, and you know. And so we kept this, and it was great. I mean, it was fabulous. We did four hours of improv six nights a week. So we, when we came out of there, man, we had chops a go-go, you know. It was like we knew we, we had a lot of stage experience and with a very hostile audience. 
Right. Now, they tried to beat us up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the guys would get drunk. Hey, what the hell is this? And they climb on stage and try to, and try to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Stan, uh, Tommy had his brother, Stan, who was actually a killer, and, and, and his buddies, and they, were our, they stood at the end of the stage. And, and Stan, he, he was such a thug. And I'll tell you, give a story over here. He, once he, he kept complaining that his knuckle hurt. And he kept bitching and bitching. Tommy says, why don't you go to the doctor, get it checked out, I'll pay for it. And so, okay. so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor examines and says, well, you have a tooth in your knuckle here. <laughs> <laughs> Smacked some guy, the tooth was still in his knuckle, you know, a week later. Yeah, so, oh. so that was kind of the milieu. <laughs> if a strip cup can have a milieu, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and so at this time, you were still Richard and Tommy. When did Cheech yeah. and Chong develop? When did that happen? After our very first gig. You know, we had that, because we were both musicians all our life and singers and guitar players. And, and we, after the troupe broke up, because the rest of the troupe wanted to go to the hills to get their heads together. That's what you did in those days. And we had been to the hills, and our head was together. And we, our, our pocketbook wasn't together. And so we wanted to form this group. We said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll form a band, and we'll, and we'll do music, and we'll do skits. You know, you're a singer, I'm a guitar player. We'll do skits uh, that we've been developing, and we'll do uh, and music. And we, maybe we can play Vegas one day. Wow, that's, that's, that's great, you know? And um, so we started, and we went, the, our first gig was a battle of the bands at the Gardens Auditorium of Vancouver. And, and, and we got up, and, and, and the band was on there, they were ready to play. And we came out and started doing skits. And it, it was really amazing, because it was just, this was a young, hippie audience, you know, uh, or hippie-esque audience. Uh, and, and they would, had never seen us before. They weren't going to come down to that club. You know, there, there was no way that anybody in that audience was going to come down that club and see us. So we were really new to them. Mm -hmm. And they were intrigued. We were doing the, we were speaking to them, only had they had never heard us before. We were them. And so they were intrigued. And they, they, cut, they jammed to the front of the stage, and, and they gathered around. And they went nuts. And we won the Battle of the Bands without playing a note. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the band just sat the band, there. Okay. <laughs> Now, now, no, no, okay, and 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 so and so we won, and, we go, and so the, the the guitar player asks us, so, the guitar, so well, when's our next gig, boss? Uh, I don't know if there's gonna be next gig, you know. So, and so we realized that we were a duo, and we could make it yeah. as a duo. So on the way home that night, we were we were in in, in Pop Chong's car, Tommy's dad, and it, and and it rains in Vancouver all the time, and and so uh, but we didn't we'd have. His car didn't have windshield wipers that worked. It had windshield wipers, they didn't work. And so he had, he had a, a wire coat hanger straightened out and it went out of the car and attached to the, the wiper and you, and you <laughs> manually by hand. And we're trying to think of a name and we're going over the Georgia Viaduct Bridge which is condemned, there's a big sign, proceed at your own risk, it's condemned, we're gonna get to it but so we don't know what. And, and we're like, okay, so like, hey, hey, we're gonna be big, man. You hear that reaction? Yeah, we're gonna be good. We need a new name uh, because it was it was billed as Tommy Chong and the Shanghai Junk, because he'd always been in groups where where he his name wasn't he was uh, Little Daddy in the Bachelors. He was a bachelor. He was a Bobby Taylor in the Vancouver's. He was a Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, all the, and he said, the next thing I'm in, I'm gonna have my name in it, so they can't replace me. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. It's a good plan. Yeah. And so I said, Yeah, me too. I don't want to get replaced. So we've turned Richard and Tommy. Nah, uh, Marin and Chong. Chong and Marin. No. And so he says, uh, Do you have a nickname? I said, Well, Cheech is my nickname. It's short for Chicharon. And and he said, <laughs> All the Mexicans left. <laughs> and and uh, he says, Cheech, Cheech, Cheech and Chong, Cheech and Chong. And that was it. Because we were musicians, we recognized that that name scanned. There was a beat to that. Mm -hmm. If you said Chong and Cheech, it's it doesn't roll out. You know, well, it's yeah. it's four four and a half time. You know, <laughs> and you just wanted it to be four four, and it was Cheech, and it was always Cheech and Chong. Right. So, how much of your act, or I guess how much of your material, which has to deal a lot with uh, with the pot smoking characters yeah, and yeah. whatnot, how much of that is actually 
the two of you normally versus your own personal advocacy? <laughs> well, Tommy used to say that that was us when our wives weren't around. You know, <laughs> and pretty much it was true. Um, you know, it, we were reflecting what we saw on the streets and all the characters we were running into. Mm -hmm. We didn't smoke a, a whole lot of, of dough. I mean, we don't as much as anybody. I mean, you know, in that in that era. <laughs> Uh, but but we were we were hard working trying to get this act together mm -hmm. and, and that's all we worked on all the time and so it was like hmm. but we 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 came up with these personas you know that and and, and not even the Cheech character was fully formed in Vancouver because they didn't have a lot of lowriders in Vancouver mm -hmm. you know so you know, it wasn't until we got back to the states and so we decided well if we're gonna if we're gonna make it big we got to go to either New York or uh, uh, L A. And I uh, says, no, I heard it snows in New York. So I'm not going there because I've been have had enough snow. And so and I was from L.A. and I knew people. The fly in the ointment was that I was wanted by the FBI. Right. And, you know. <laughs> for the draft dodger. For the draft dodger. Yeah. And uh, it was draft resistance. <laughs> I, I, they knew I was there. I wasn't dodging anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, it was funny because it was in the days before computers. So their information systems flow, whatever that's called, uh, was non-existent. And so I, I got in. I was wanted, uh, uh, but I, I got in using a phony ID of my friend Bill Knorr with his picture on it. <laughs> I presented it to the guard. The, hey, that's me. And it uh, well, looks brown, brown. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back to the U.S., although I was wanted for a long time when I was back. Wow. So and Tommy thought it was really funny if he mentioned that all the time on stage. Oh, they, <laughs> he kept pointing out the yeah, Gary Lee. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. wanted by the FBI. So well, shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> that shit ain't funny. So you came back to you came back to LA. You guys were not really a comedy act, not really a musical act, and but then you got signed to a record label. Yeah. And were the first the first comedians on FM radio. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, you know, it was like everything was in flux. There was a huge changes going on in the, in the country, and l things that were non-traditional could could find root, you know, and mm -hmm. grow. And, and we were one of them. And we were we we'd go around and, and we'd hunt for gigs all the time. And and we only had one goal every day was to somehow get our hands on a dollar fifty. And for a dollar fifty, we could make some Chinese meal. Rice and beef and greens or something, you know, mm -hmm. and we could eat and, uh, and we'd not starve. And and so we, we always walking around. We walk around neighborhoods and look for cars, car, you know, uh, clubs and hey or anything, you know, anything. Uh, they have a school here. We can perform in the quadrangle, you know, and just to just to be on stage and, and mostly black clubs. Hmm. And it was really really great, man. There was hmm. a, we had a, we had a, a giant audience in, in the black neighborhood. And, but at, and, on the off hours, we play these white clubs that, that didn't pay money, you know. But it was exposure. So eventually, we um, we uh, got discovered at the Troubadour, which is the club of note in that day. And everybody was uh, that whole singer songwriter Eagles, Linda Ronstadt, J D. Souther, they were all there, and mm -hmm. they got discovered there. And so we we started playing these hoot nights uh, on Monday, open mic night, basically, and. Um, and we started attracting an audience and a following. And then one night, uh, uh, although the thing was set up for these producers at Warner Brothers Records, uh, Lou Adler, this famous record producer, was in the audience. Coincidentally, Lou Adler had grown up in East L.A. You know, and he, he knew about a Chicano lowrider culture, and he immediately recognized what we were doing. And he sent word through, uh, through this girl. They said that Lou Adler saw you, and he wants you to... Give him a call, and uh, Tommy had no idea who Lou Adler was. You know? I mean, he was the biggest record producer in the world at the time. Uh, he had produced uh, Sam Cooke, Johnny Rivers, The Spirit, The Mamas and Papas, uh, 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 founded Monterey Pop, uh, and he was just about to release uh, Tapestry by Carole King, and it was it was he was a big deal. So we, we we called him up and went to his office the next day. And he, and he looked at us, he says, well, what do you want to do? And we looked around his office, and it's covered in gold records. There's gold records everywhere. I says, well, I'll make a record. We want to make a record, yeah. 
Well, what kind? Uh, gold. It seems, like <laughs> <laughs> seems to be that's what you make, so <laughs> we would like to make a gold record, you know? And so he, he signed us to, uh, to a deal, you know? Uh, not much money, but, you know, enough to, uh, to keep us off of starvation. And so we started working on how to convert what we were doing on stage to record. And we had no idea, you know, how to do that, mm -hmm. you know, because we were a visual act. And so through a process that we invented ourselves, we, we realized that you had to make things that sounded funny. Not that look funny, but that sounded funny because they had to translate by ear. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you, you quickly learned that some knife sound funnier than others, you know, because <laughs> we did all our own uh, 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 sound effects in recording. And so we started this process in the studio. And unlike our contemporaries like Richard Pryor or Lily Tomlin or George Carlin or Steve Martin, who's whose record act consisted of a live recording of their stage act. It was a soundtrack. You hear everybody laughing and when to laugh. We started creating these scenes in, in, the, in the studio with, with characters and with a lot of sound effects and a lot of atmosphere because we were influenced by other people who mm -hmm. came before us, uh, notably Ken Nordine, this, this, uh, uh, this guy that came out in the, in the early 60s. And, and we started creating these things, and they, they, they took hold. And when they got released, it was perfect for the album listening generation because albums were starting to be the big thing. It was a big explosion of albums, and, people, and the kids wanted albums. And, and FM radio was the only place that you could go to hear albums. Uh, it wasn't top 40, yummy, 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 I got love in my tummy, you know? It was like... These weird, these weird sounds, you know. <laughs> you know, you can get away with it because people listen with headphones, and we so we, we catered to that mm -hmm. audience to a lot of, you know, there's a lot of panning of jet planes through the middle of your head and out the thing and guns, you know, whatever, whatever it was. But mm -hmm. we played to that, and it, and it, and 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 it exploded on FM radio. Wow. Uh, so we're actually a little bit short on time. If anybody has questions, step yeah. up to the mics here. Um, but uh, you you basically said that you went from pretty much being dirt broke to having over a million dollars in checks sitting on your on your counter without a bank account to put them in by the yeah. way uh, within 6 months yeah right so you were how you were on tour the whole time yeah we were always on tour we do, used to do over 300 nights a year Whoa. for 8 years like always on the road and, we, and the only way we got off the road is is if one of us needed an operation for something <laughs> really. we used to right. call it dry dock we're going to go to dry dock Tommy needs some teeth I need a knee and <laughs> really that's what happened so we would go to dry dock and then <sighs> I remember like it the first time we ever went on a big tour when the first record was, we went on for 3 months and never came back. It was just two guys, and we mm -hmm. and we uh, we went all the way across the country. Landed in Montreal. Went to England. Did some time there. Landed back in the east and worked our way all the way back. And 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 I got home, and all I wanted to do is sit in my living room, and and make it stop. Make maybe you know I didn't want to stop it. This world is going too fast. It's like I just want to look out the window. And my girlfriend at the time could not, because, hey, I was home. Let's go out. Let's go dinner. Let's go this. I was like, shut up. I want to. <laughs> and, I, and, and I, you know, finally it, it did. And then we would start it. In, in a week, we would start again mm -hmm. on, on a, a three-month wow. tour. But we, the, the, the point you made, it brought up is that we would get these checks. Our, our album was selling. It was a big deal. It started selling. And, and we would get a check for, like, $800,000. And the next so day. In the late 70s. That was Still a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money. That was anyway, early 70s, early and it was 70s. a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and then with the next day, we get another check for $700,000. Wow. And we kept getting, wow. Was that? We didn't know what to do with it. Neither one of us had a car. Or, you know, <laughs> really, really and a car, a house, because we were on the we didn't need a car on the road. And so finally, we got time enough to, you know, rent a better apartment or a house. And, and I kept going on that for, like that for years. Wow. You know. Wow, and then, so the movies, uh, movies started to happen because yeah. you went from radio to movies, which I think is probably when I would describe the uh, more realistic conflict started coming in between you and Tommy. Yeah, it's, you know, movies is an interesting phenomenon, and 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 the people that work in it because it's a, it's it's a it's a dream factory and it's myth making and the people 
that are, make the movies or get involved in this myth of the movies and their and their larger than life characters and that and it, it inflates the worst parts of you, mm -hmm. and you can be a a megalomaniac or a humble saint uh, within two seconds of each other, you know, and, and it kept fluxing back. And so there was always a, 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 a conversation, a contentious conversation between Tommy and I because we were very strong personalities, mm -hmm. and two of them, and, but it was the irritant that produced the pearl, you know, and we always worked it out. And then, but as movies went on, there, there, there was a real division of chores there. There's going to be one person as director, one person is going to be the writer, one person the. As we went along and got more success, Tommy wanted to be everything. He wanted to be the director and the sole writer and everything. And I said, "What I I just come in, I say your lines. Like, Are you out of your fucking mind? You know." And so that tension kept building and building until. Mm -hmm. Till we, uh, he didn't want me to write anymore. He just wanted to like, I said, well, what the, you know? So uh, we had worked our way over to, we were living in Paris at the time and for, uh, I, I lived there for a year, he lived there for three years. And uh, the last movie came out, the, uh, the Corsican Brothers, and he stayed in Paris and I came, my marriage was, was falling apart and, uh, and I just didn't want to do what we were doing anymore. I didn't want to argue with him anymore, I didn't want to fight with him anymore. And uh, I came back to L.A. And uh, I sat there in a, a smoked dope and played guitar for <laughs> as long as I could. And then I was watching TV one day, and then this phenomenon happened. It was MTV. And, and it, was, it took over music. And everybody watched MTV 24 hours a day, and it was videos. And I, and I realized that this is perfect for us. This was, we were filmmakers, we were musicians, we were comedians, and we could make these funny videos. We could put them all together, have a video album. It would be great. We could take over the world. And I called Tommy in, in, in Paris, and, I, and, I, and I, I said, I got this deal. We can make, uh, we do this. And uh, he wasn't interested. Hmm. He said, well, I told him, I said, yeah, yeah, we have MTV over here in France, and I just, I, you're into video, I'm into film. Kiss my ass, motherfucker. <laughs> you know, I just like, what the fuck, man? You know, I so, said, well, look, I got this deal, uh, and let's come over. You come over, and we'll, I said, well, I'll come over. I'll do a couple of them. And so, one of the ones, uh, so I'm trying to write these other songs and videos, and, and I had, I needed one more, and I was at my kitchen table in, in the morning, and I was having a cup of coffee, reading the paper, and the music was playing. And uh, uh, reading this article about this young kid, Chicano kid in LA, he was like, 12, 13 around there, and he was, he, he was mentally retarded, and, and he couldn't communicate to the, uh, he got caught in an immigration raid, and he couldn't communicate to the officers that he was an uh, American citizen, and they, they s deported him mm -hmm. to Mexico, and his parents didn't know where, the, where he was for almost two months, mm -hmm. and they just dumped him on the streets of Tijuana, and that was it. And so I started, and, as I'm, and Bruce Springsteen's song comes on at that Sunday, born in the USA, and I like kept saying, born in East LA, you know? <laughs> and that was it, that was the last song. So I wrote the song, and, and, uh, and I, 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 we were gonna record it. We're in the studio, and I almost fi had finished it, but the middle section, which was for two guys, improv back and forth, which was our forte, that's how we always did everything. Uh, was for Tommy and I, and I, and it, and and he wasn't in the studio, and I, and I waited and waited. It was almost nine o'clock, and I, what's, what's wrong with him? So I picked up the phone, called him, and he was home. I said, hey, 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 Tommy, did you, did you forget we had this radio uh, recording day? He says, ah, no, you do it, man. What? No, no, man, we got to do the middle section. He says, no, no, it's your song, you do it. I said, what? Well, come on, man, we got the the thing is for us, and it's no, it's your, you do it, it's your your thing. So you're not coming in. No, you do it. Oh, and I was I was really sad. I was really sad because I had always been there for him, and uh, the first thing I asked him to be there for me, and and he and he because it was a tug of he didn't yeah. you know he he was it was a battle for there. So was that the definitive end of Cheech and Chong right there? I would say pretty much. Yeah. What happened, and you know you got to be careful what you do. As I, as I went and I recorded the song, I, I played both parts. The song came out. And the video came out, and he wasn't in the song, so he wasn't in the video, and and both became really big hits. Mm -hmm. They were a number one song and a number one video, blah blah blah. And the head of the studio in Columbia, Frank Price, 
uh, I got turned on to the video by Irving Azoff, who was a record producer, and, and he called me. We had already made two movies for him, and he called me in and said, uh, I think there's a movie here, and, and, but it's, a, it's for you. It's not a team movie, it's a, because it's, there's no drugs involved, and it's for you, your persona. <laughs> and so, and so I, 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 if you want to, there's a movie here, and I, and I want you to star in it and, and write it. And the, okay. So I, Tommy and I had a meeting. He came over ostensibly to pitch me a, a, a story for a, a TV series. And, I, and it was, I, before he got started, I said, look, man, this is what happened. I got offered this movie by Frank Price, and I'm going to do it. And it was like, there it was. Hmm. And he just got mad and got shook and turned around and walked into his car, and, and that was it. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left. I've only got through like half of my, my yeah. notes right here. Um, you simply must buy the book. It's called yes. Shoots is not my real name. <laughs> uh, you were, I mean, you went, you, you were voice, uh, friends with John Lasseter, who made you the voice of many of his characters yeah. in Disney and Pixar, including Tito the Chihuahua from yeah. Oliver and Company. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, me too. Can you give us a check it out? No, check it out! <laughs> <laughs> there was one bit of direction, George Schro uh, uh, Schrader, uh, uh, well, and he was Colum he was Panamanian. This guy George Schrader, anyway, spoke perfect Spanish, and and he and he and I went into like you know I was looking for a gig to do after, and 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 it, I got this call to come in and audition for this thing, and and I went in there and I didn't know how to I never had an audition for anything ever, mm -hmm. you know, and I started did the the uh, text that they have and everybody go oh that's that's a, that's very nice you know, and I got into the parking lot I said that sucked, man I was that's why I. I went back in and said, I, I, that what I did is suck. I want to do it again. They go, okay, go. And so George gave me one bit of direction. He says, play this ter character, Tito, which is a chihuahua, like you have one finger in a light socket. That's all I needed. You know? <laughs> I'm right at the top of my voice, and, and the movie, it was a breakout character, right. and the movie became a big hit. And then I started on this road of animated movies. And, and it was what I was born to do, I mean, or was, was trained to do more than anything, because animation was Cheech and Chong without the animation. Mm -hmm. It was voice acting, and I knew how to do that. So a string of movies, The Lion King, a Cars, uh, and we're still doing Cars right now. And so. Yeah, right, right. Um, and there's so much, I mean, there's so much about you. These guys don't got nothing to do. They can go in the little cubby holes and <laughs> <laughs> order free food and lay back. And, Watch TV. This is much more informative, right? <laughs> um, yeah, there's so much I want to cover, and we Go don't ahead. have time for it. I mean, so you've been like a Cub Scout, Boy Scout, altar boy, guitar player, potter, yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything. You've danced with Kate Middleton, yeah. and now uh, you're the owner. <laughs> <laughs> she asked me. <laughs> the, you are the largest you're the owner of the largest Chicano art collection yeah right in the known hemisphere in the known in the no, are there any unknown hemispheres well I you know sure <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I want to give you a quick plug before we wrap up here um, so what is this Ooh, this is a bottle um, <laughs> it's a concept in western civilization um, this is my new line of mezcal uh, called Tres Papalote, which means three kites. So you can get higher than three kites on this stuff. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I said, a, a company came to me and says, we'd like you to be involved in the beverage industry. And uh, how about some wine? I said, well, I could drink it, but I don't know anything about it. And they said, well, how about, uh, you're Mexican, how about some tequila? <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I said, Thanks, asshole. Yeah, that's well, okay, you know. Uh, well, there's a zillion tequilas out there. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know what's an undiscovered category is mezcal. And so when we do a mezcal, what's that? That's the one with the worm in it, isn't it? Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's mezcal, and it's a, it's a very uh, distinct artisanal uh, beverage. And so we started investigating, and we thought, hey, this is a coming thing, and it's really good. It's some, something new to drink that has a distinctive smoky taste, and it's like tequila. I, I, I call it tequila with, with tattoos, you know? <laughs> and, it's, and, it's like, and it's, now it's catching on. There's mezcal bars everywhere, and it's the hipster thing to do. And, and, uh, and, uh, and millennials love it, and I love it, and it's a great drink to drink millennials, millennials yeah that's that's the new term that's, it, which that's, is now like the largest consumer of boxed wine as well yes exactly <laughs> here's a here's a little, little fact 84% of all wine is drunk 
48 hours after its purchase. All wine. That's why I don't have corks anymore. Yeah, don't need them. You don't need them. You know, but <laughs> like, you know, these these 50 year old Cabernets. Yeah, you know, that's like that much of the market. You know, <laughs> 48 hours, 84 wow. percent of all wine. Huh. Uh, so, anyways, we started. We put this out, and it's been highly successful. And this is one of the figures from my Chicano art collection. It's a glass uh, a statue by the De La Torre brothers. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get them jobs, too, you know, because Mexicans help each other. And, <laughs> and they're all related. <laughs> and so, and, and, and I think, uh, we had, do we have something for, no? No, we get, you get to look at it. Hey. <laughs> there you go. It's like a, and it's a great, great drink, uh, Tres Papalote. I wish we had some, some art books. We didn't bring any art books. With no. Us. We're trying to get rid of them, too. Um, uh oh. Ship nope. them over, we'll give them out. Yeah, we, no, right. I just might do that. All right. All right. What's, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was going to wrap up. You, okay. I want to continue your story, though. Oh, this, you know, I'm just, as, as things come into your screen, you go, oh, I could be involved in that. You guys are going to be the first to know about it. Uh, I'm coming out with my own uh, weed line called uh, Cheech's Private Stash. <laughs> It'll be available wherever fine weed is sold. <laughs> Mostly online, uh, no, but it, but it's. I mean, it's it's uh, millennials like it, you know. <laughs> Along Did with you know that most weed is smoked twenty four hours after purchase. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting thing, you know, because it's uh, we were waiting to see where the government was going to come down with with Trump and 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 the uh, Mr. Peanut. Uh, and, <laughs> And, and are they going to go uh, uh, buy these guys? But, uh, but even Sessions is not dumb enough to go up against 33 states, mm -hmm. and he's a states' rights advocate. You know, I mean, like, you can't have states' rights for some things and not states' rights for other things. And so now they're the indications. Well, no, we're just going to leave the marijuana thing. Because it's a great, uh, there's going to be a lot of pushback from the other side who are well-funded. Yep. And the states... Uh, who uh, uh, get 200 to 300 million dollars in taxes for their beleaguered states every year, mm -hmm. and I think it's it, you know it's it's the the, the intoxic the per intoxicant of choice of gener now generations uh, rather than and and it's, I mean I haven't made and it has medicinal qualities um, for sure and and uh, I haven't I haven't heard any argument for medical beer yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, your liver is too good. Have yeah, no, have a little bit, yeah, uh, pickle hurt. it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and and so it was all these things coming, and they go with with lifestyle because we're increasingly involved in lifestyle, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, so we're, uh, and we're figuring out how the market works. You know, because because you can only grow and sell weed in the state and ones in the state that you're in. Mm -hmm. You can't transport it across state lines to sell California weed in Colorado or th so it's and, and there's for every state that has legalized some form of legalized some form of legalized weed there is an equal and opposite group on the other side that wants to undo all those laws mm -hmm. and they throw logs in your path every, all the time but this thing keeps more it's like a lava flow you know <laughs> I mean you can stand in front of it but I just wouldn't recommend it you know <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to be it's going to and it's going to cross the nation yeah and across, it's, the thing that they're going to find out is there's uh, people that smoke marijuana in every single stratum of society, uh, uh, financial, religious, uh, ethnic, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and that's good luck mm -hmm. fighting. I, and I think they kind of looked over the abyss. <laughs> no, I don't think we're going on there. You know? yeah. So that's happening. So you Cheech's private stash. <laughs> is there a website to get more? Not yet. Okay. But there will be. We'll has. add it to the YouTube description for this video. Once yes, you please. It. <laughs> yeah. it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it has really medicinal properties. I, I think it's really good. And, 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 and that, the weed, that's it, what I'm taking from this. That's it. Yeah. I, I had just had a, 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 a nausea of, caused by some uh, a stomach problems, and I was taking all the prescribed medications, and it was only weed that stopped this nausea. And nausea, I don't know if anybody's had a bottle of nausea here that's long going. It's debilitating. I mean, it's really debilitating because, like, oh, it just, oh man, I feel like shit. And and we knocked it out right away, mm -hmm. you know. And I didn't, I didn't want to admit it because I, you know, I don't want to be. And and uh, but uh, you know, it's nice.
So what's <laughs> <laughs> what's next then for you? You've got like something, your name on it, so everything under the sun. Well, here. I'm a what, Chicano. I have to have next? three jobs at all times, you know. <laughs> yeah. right. I, I just, I, I was raised that way. My dad yeah. I was, I always had three jobs, and you, know, you got to have three jobs, okay. And, and so I'm going to continue writing, which I, I, I really enjoy, because I was a writer all my I was an English major in college, and I wrote all the time. So I'd like, there's a couple things that I, I really want to write. I'm, I'm writing, I'm halfway through a, a, a book of uh, essays about the Latino experience in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's called We Come in Peace and We Have You Surrounded. And, <laughs> Sort of a cautionary tale, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm writing this this uh, uh, novella uh, called Hector, and it's about this young Chicano kid who belongs to the world's smallest minority. He's a Mexican vegetarian, because you know a lot of those, and 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 the travails he's got. There's sort of magical realism aspects of it because I'm a big uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez fan. Mm -hmm. and who, if you read this book, uh, Cheech is not my real name. Uh, I I meet uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez in in Havana, and I mean, it's like meeting Shakespeare for me. You know, it's like. That's, that's Gabo, and he's standing there, and I'm being introduced, and now he's going to shake my hand. Wow. And, and he says hello really deeply, and then splits. That's it. <laughs> hello. Okay, cool. But uh, I, that's the thing about celebrity. You get to meet all the people that, that, that you uh, uh, adore, yeah. you know, and, and he was one of them. Wow. Well, uh, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you this very much. Thanks wonderful. for having me. I appreciate it. Man. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.